Join Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app to binge true love one week early and ad-free. A quick note that this episode contains some adult language and talk about sex. Diane Henning stands in the bathroom looking at her face in the mirror. She's supposed to be putting on her makeup, but this morning she's finding it hard to look at herself because guilt is a powerful feeling. It's been two days since the kiss in the movie theater, and she still can't shake the feeling of it. His lips, his touch. Does Diane regret taking a job writing a biography of a man who represents everything she hates about DC? The boys club, the privilege, the hierarchy? Does she regret flirting with him to make him drop his guard? Does she regret kissing him in that movie theater? The answer to all these questions is, yes, Diane regrets them all. But it's hard to argue with the smile on her face when she goes to sleep at night. Diane hears Tim walking towards the bathroom door. She's not in the mood to talk. Honey, I was just wondering, will you be home for dinner tonight? Are you asking me if I'll be home, or are you asking me if I'm cooking? Both, I guess. I don't know, I've been really busy writing. I know, and I'm really proud of you. General Evans is a big get. It's just, I mean, the other night you never showed up to the party. I wanted to show you off a little, that's all. Uh, hello? I'll let you know, okay? Okay. She brushes her favorite eyeshadow across her lids and smiles. She thinks back to the moment she pulled away from Logan in the darkness of the movie theater. The moment she locked eyes with him. She made the first move, but as he looked at her with those impossibly blue eyes, she wondered, which one of us is in control? Me or him? Diane looks at her phone. It's been two days since the kiss. She wonders to herself. Is it too soon to call? Wondery's new investigative podcast miniseries, Harsh Reality, digs into the -the behind-the-scenes drama of one of the most controversial reality TV disasters of all time. It's a story of love, lies, and reality television. To hear the whole story, follow Harsh Reality, the story of Miriam Rivera on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. From Wondery, I'm Amber Rashawn Williams. And I'm Justin Walker-White. And this is True Love. Each week, we bring you scandalous stories of love, lust, and heartbreak. In last week's episode, Diane shared a kiss with the general. So this leads Diane to ask herself one very important question. This is episode two. Have you lost your mind? A grace will fly into the fiery sea. The door to the Oval Office swings open, and Logan quickly smooths his hair. General Evans, come on in. Everyone in the world knows that voice. It's the President of the United States, Charles Samuels. No matter how many times Logan has seen the President in person, he's always in awe. There's no denying it. President Charles Samuels has movie star quality. It's not just the Kennedy hair or the perfectly tailored suit. It's the confidence that comes with power. For a second there, Logan thought he might have the President all to himself. But then off to his right, he sees the chief of staff, Richard Collins. General Evans, always a pleasure. The smile he gives Logan is almost sarcastic. The president, Collins, and Logan take a seat on the Oval Office couch. Collins turns towards Logan. Thanks for coming in. I should start by saying that I really appreciate how upfront you've been with us about the vice president. When you told us that our allies were concerned with his relationship with the White House, well, that was concerning. But I can tell you now... We've got our eyes on the situation. The president points at Logan. I always appreciate the men who look out for me. Of course, sir. I knew it was something that you'd want to hear about. You're right, and I do have to make a few changes within this administration. Logan tries not to smile. This is probably how his son feels when he knows he's getting a new PlayStation. General, you're a patriot and an honorable man, which is why I know you'll understand what I'm about to say. I need you to step down as the director of the CIA. Step down from the CIA? It's like someone had suddenly sucked the air out of the room. I'm sorry, I I thought you said you need me to step down after 30 years of serving this country. Sir, I have a purple heart. And then Colin speaks. That suck-ass pissant. He's behind this. Logan knows it. You'll make the announcement next week and name your second in command, Albert Jacobson, as the new director. I can see by the look on your face that you're pretty shocked, but you need to trust me. I can't say too much right now. This administration leaks like my grandmother's depends. (laughs) You'll just have to trust me for now. 
Sir, have I done something wrong? Not at all. I promise it will all work out in your favor. Richard here will walk you out. Always a pleasure seeing you. Yeah. What the hell just happened? This morning he was on top of the world, and now he's six feet under? But after all his years in the military, Logan's learned to never surrender without a fight. Diane opens the door and gives a great big hug to her older sister, Loretta. Why does this place always smell like you baking bread? It's probably just mold. Diane steps aside and watches her sister nonchalantly scan the living room for any new or expensive items. If it costs more than $10, Loretta says it's a waste of money. They take a seat on the couch as Diane hands Loretta a cup of tea. I got a writing job. Diane doesn't see her sister as often as she likes, but for the most important details of her life, sisterly validation is what she craves. Oh, that's great. Is it writing for... I'm writing a biography on General Evans, the head of the CIA. Loretta takes a sip of tea and then looks down at Diane's expensive-looking coffee table. Do I need a coaster for this cup? No, it didn't even cost that much. And did you hear what I said? I heard. You're selling out. I knew it. I knew you wouldn't understand. Mm-hmm. Stop sister girl me and listen. My editor thinks I'm writing a glowing biography. But what I'm really doing is getting the general to talk about the inner workings of Washington. I'm going to do a huge expose on the glad handing, the backdoor dealing, the misogyny and the racism. Mm hmm. Diane and Loretta live in two different worlds now. Diane in her upper middle class townhome and Loretta in her crime ridden neighborhood. Diane's always felt guilty about marrying well, especially since Loretta is a single mother who struggles every single damn day. But sometimes her judginess can be too much. What makes you think you'll get him to talk about all of that? Because powerful men like him want to talk. They're all ego. Butter them up in the right way and they'll tell you anything. Oh, hell. Your dumbass likes him. What? Are you insane? Powerful men. You say that shit with admiration. You probably go to the interview in a tiny skirt and do that lower voice sexy thing. Does Tim know about this powerful man you working with? Of course Tim knows. It's just a job. And besides, Tim is also a powerful man in Washington. Girl, he's a dentist. Shut up. No one knows you better than me. And I see that look in your eyes. You think you're in control of the situation. But like you said, this dude is the head of the CIA. He's going to see your Scooby-Doo plan a mile away. You're way off, Loretta. You should have more faith in your sister. I guess we'll see. Meanwhile, I've got some good news for you. I'm always up for some good news. The president of Spelman University reached out to me and wants you to do a book reading this weekend. Spelman... Why'd you ask it like that, with your voice going all up at the end? These are the women that held you up when you released your first book, Diane. How are you going to turn your back on them now? The worst thing about Loretta is how insufferably righteous she is. It's annoying. But even worse, she's usually got a point. Loretta stands up and walks towards the front door. Okay, you're right. I know I'm right. Besides, you need some space from old-ass Captain America. Loretta sees all, girl. Diane can't believe how little faith her sister has in her. A crush? On Logan? <laughs> sure, the kiss was fun, but that was one and done. Maybe Loretta has a point, though. Maybe Diane has been too friendly with her subject. But no more, because the next time Diane sees Logan, it's going to be all business. Logan enters CIA headquarters without knowing exactly how he got there. Since he left the Oval Office, everything is a total blur. He wants to believe this is all some grand plan by POTUS and Collins. But he has no idea what they're thinking. Maybe the simplest explanation is the truest. He just got shit canned. And soon, everyone is going to know it. Logan quickly pulls himself together. He ran battles in Iran and the Gaza Strip. He can certainly handle this. He just needs some time alone to think through a plan. An analyst steps into his path and Logan nearly mows him down. Sir? Not now. He continues walking at a rapid pace, ready to retreat into his office. Then he sees Albert Jacobson, his CIA deputy director. If there is one person Logan absolutely positively does not want to speak to right now, it's Jacobson. A minute, sir? Logan keeps walking. Albert takes this as an invitation to join him. Morning, sir. I heard that you had a meeting up at the Oval, and it wasn't in the books, so I was just wondering if there was anything that I should be briefed about. He's not surprised Albert has already heard the news. Nothing's a secret in this political jungle, but does he have to look so damn smug about it all? Now he has to play on offense. Yes, Albert, I've been meaning to talk to you about something, but I had to speak to the president first. Sir? I've decided to step down as director. So what I heard is true. I get it, though. If I were in your shoes, I'd do the same thing. Thanks, Albert. I appreciate it. 
There's an upside as well. What's that? My replacement. I told the president that he'd be crazy not to choose you as the new CIA director. Oh, you were behind that. When they called me this morning, I wasn't sure how I was even going to bring it up with you. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Albert pats him on the arm and walks off. Now he has a decision to make. Disappear into the sunset or fight. Fight like hell. Fighting is what he does, and he's not going to stop now. If he's going down, he's taking everyone with him. But to do that, he'll need some help. Logan retreats into his office and sits behind his desk. The blue light from the computer screen washes over his face. A lifetime of service gone in an instant because of snakes like Richard Collins. Logan looks over at his diploma from West Point. Their school motto is duty, honor, country. These aren't just words to Logan, it's a way of life. For someone like Collins, these words might as well be on a bumper sticker. What's worse, Collins is a major shareholder for Black Bolt, a private military company that provides mercenaries to the government. Where was Collins' honor when Black Bolt raided Saddam Hussein's palace? Wait, Black Bolt, that's it. Logan types in his security clearance on the computer and navigates to the file section. He then scrolls down to a folder titled Private Contractors and presses Enter. And there it is, Black Bolt. Logan opens a few files. He quickly reads, yes, this is exactly what he's looking for. He lifts his pointer finger over the print function. If Logan does this, there's no turning back. But he didn't start this. They did. Logan presses the print button. As Logan watches the paper being filled with classified ink, he knows that all this is for nothing unless Diane is on board. He needs to see her immediately. There's a reason why the Hay Adams was voted the best hotel in Washington, D.C. The lobby is filled with rich mahogany wood and Romanesque arches. Something about the hotel lobby's opulence makes her meeting Logan here feel somehow inappropriate, illicit. But she has to remind herself that meeting and interviewing General Evans is her job right now. It's a text from Logan. Turn around. Diane turns around to see Logan standing behind her. She's surprised to see him dressed so casually. So far, Diane's only seen Logan in a suit, and the denim jeans are throwing her off. He's also carrying a brown leather briefcase, which makes him look like he's selling life insurance. Either way, Diane is going to keep it strictly business. No banter. General Evans, how are you? I'm fine. Did you bring your laptop with you? I did. What's going on? Maybe this was a mistake. This hotel is usually pretty empty during the week, but now it feels like we are being watched. Being watched? Diane wonders why Logan is being so paranoid all of a sudden. Let me go to the front desk and see if we can rent a conference room. Five minutes later, she's holding a key to the largest conference room in the hotel. The only one that wasn't booked. It cost her nearly 300 bucks for an hour, but she hopes it will be worth it. She needs Logan to open up. She cracks open the conference room door and is surprised to see lilacs and lilies everywhere. Apparently, it's part of the French Mediterranean theme. Looks more like a funeral. Oh well, at least they have complete privacy. Now, she just needs to make sure Logan knows this is going to be strictly business. General, uh, about the movie theater. Logan, listen, we don't have much time. I need you to take this. It's a burner phone. It's the best way for us to communicate from now on. There are a lot of things happening right now, and, and we need to be more discreet. Wait, wait, what's going on? Diane watches Logan put his briefcase on the conference room table and open it. Part of Diane was worried that there'd be a gun in his briefcase, along with a long black silencer. But it's just a small stack of papers. What am I looking at? Logan points to a name on the paper. Black Bolt. It's a private military organization. The government hires them to do jobs that we can't. To be clear, there's nothing illegal about hiring them. Yeah, I've heard of Black Bolt. So what's your point? Logan steps forward and takes both her hands. His face is so close she can feel his breath. And again, those eyes... Diane swears that if this man was ever involved in an interrogation, he got those poor suckers to tell him whatever he wanted to know with one stare. Diane, I know we've just met, but I need to know. Can I trust you? You can trust me to be honest. I need you to be honest, but also for the time being, discreet. I can't make you any promises about what I write. I'm going to follow the truth. I have nothing to hide. And neither one of us wants this biography to be a puff piece, right? That's right. So we can help each other. I was hesitant to tell you some things that are happening, but... If I know I can trust you, I'll tell you everything. Diane did not see this coming. She was going to pump Logan for information. Now he's just offering it up on a silver platter? What's changed? Are you clear on everything? Crystal, you can trust me. You have to understand. This goes all the way up to the White House. Black Bolt was first in when we raided Saddam Hussein's palace. There were reports that he had at least 600 million in cash and gold, all of which was mysteriously gone when the U.S. military came on the scene five hours later. 
600 million. Gone. Just like that. And guess who a major shareholder is? Diane knows the answer. Richard Collins. Exactly. It isn't right, Diane. The world needs to know. And I can't do this without you. She hates the way he looks at her. All smiles and hypnotizing blue eyes. Then she reminds herself, this is what they do. Men who have this kind of power. She hates it because she feels herself falling under his spell. Then Logan leans in and kisses her. And this time, it doesn't resolve with a gentle kiss. It's deep, sensual, and without end. But then, Diane pushes Logan away. Stop, we, we can't do this. I'm sorry, I just- What kind of person do you think I am anyway? I'm a writer, not a mistress. I, I didn't say you were. Why, why, why are you mad at me right now? Look, let's just keep this professional, okay? No flirting, no late night calls, and definitely no more meetings in hotels. I gotta go. Diane turns around, swings the door open, and storms out. She made a big show of being angry just now, but the person she's really mad at is herself. Yet another stupid decision that put her in a compromising position. Damn it, get it together. Her trip up to Spellman will be a welcome break from the insanity that is her life right now. In the early 2000s, millions of households across the world tuned in to watch contestants battle for the last rose or be the final survivor on the island. Reality TV was beginning to dominate the airwaves, and every show needed to be bigger, flashier, and more scandalous than the last. But in the case of one infamous dating show, the real drama was happening off screen, and it would shape the future of reality TV. The reality TV series, There's Something About Miriam, seemed like a pretty standard dating competition. Six young men vied for the affection of Miriam Rivera, a beautiful model from Mexico. But when Miriam revealed that she was a trans woman during the show's finale, the on-screen drama sparked an international uproar about gender, sexuality, and whether reality television had finally gone too far. Follow Harsh Reality, the story of Miriam Rivera, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Logan sits in a luxury private car on an Amtrak train. He can't believe he let his guard down and kissed Diane back at the hotel. He feels like Diane doesn't trust him anymore. But the way she looks at him with those big brown eyes, the way her forehead crinkles when he says something stupid, he couldn't help it. Logan has never met anyone like her before. He needs to apologize and get Diane back in his corner. A trip down to Atlanta is just the thing to get him out of the sinkhole. Logan still has three more hours on the train, and he can't just sit here. He takes out his cell phone and scrolls to the name. David Parker. Hello? Agent Parker. General Evans, always great to hear from you. Agent Parker has been a friend for years, which is a lot to say in Washington, where friends are made because of what someone can do for you. Agent Parker is the head of cyberterrorism at the FBI. I need a favor, and it has to stay between the two of us. No one else can know. What do you have in mind? I need you to look into the chief of staff, Richard Collins. Uh... You're uncomfortable, I get it. But here's the thing. Between you and me, I've decided to step down. Yeah, I heard. It's just a formality. When I was director, I could keep my eye on Collins, but now that I'm stepping down, I want to make sure the president is taken care of. Do you have any probable cause? Just two decades in military intelligence. You gonna help or not? I don't like this. And I didn't like using my international connections for your domestic terrorism case. Okay, let me get on it. Logan looks at his watch. Three more hours and he'll be pulling into the train station. Then he'll call Diane. Spelman College. Diane can't believe she almost blew this off. Spelman is a blackety-black black women's college in Atlanta. The moment she touches her big toe on campus again, she's filled with pride, love, sugar, and spice, and everything nice. Hell, she'll even say it twice. Diane walks into the Rockefeller Fine Arts building filled with a dozen students. She wasn't expecting a Barnes & Noble-sized book reading, but there's barely enough people here to play a game of field hockey. One of the event organizers waves from across the room and rushes over. Diane Hennings? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Spader, the head of Leeds. You have no idea how happy we all are to have you here. Leeds is the annual Woman of Color Conference, and it's considered the peak of the mountaintop at Spelman. Being greeted by the head is a welcome ego boost. Miss Hennings, orientation of my soul was the only reason I got through my freshman year. I'm so excited for the young women here tonight to see someone who looks like them and wrote a best-selling novel about our shared experience. Bestseller? Diane doesn't have the heart to correct her. And suddenly she feels like a failure all over again. Ladies and ladies, please give our guest a very special Spellman welcome, Miss Diane Hennings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Spellman. Um, I wrote this book when I was a senior in college. 
It was a personal thing to me, and I'm glad that it resonates with you all. I struggle trying to figure out which passage to read. I'm not tooting my own horn, but I do love that breakup scene. <laughs> Diane looks up to see who's coming in late. The first thing she sees is the spit shine of shoes. Logan is back in one of his custom tailored suits. No more soccer dad. She's surprised to see him, especially after their conversation. She tries to hide her smile. <clears throat> Diane opens her book and stares at the passage she was supposed to read, the breakup. But when Diane looks out into the crowd and sees Logan, she begins to flip the pages to a different section. <clears throat> when I first stepped foot onto these college grounds, now these hollowed grounds, I tried to keep in mind all the well-intentioned advice my parents gave me. But they didn't tell me, don't let people use the abundance of melanin in your skin as a tool. Yes, right. This is a battle you did not sign up for. You keep throwing grenades in my space, yet you run because you cannot handle the burn. Yes. Oh. I'm not perfect. I have flaws in my skin and I have flaws in my soul, but I am no monster. Yes. You cannot teach me if you do not understand me. I am a collection of many things, but trauma is not my defining characteristic. I demand to be seen. I demand to be heard. And such is the orientation of my soul. Diane looks out at the bowl of chocolate ice cream and sees one white chocolate chip with a big smile on his face. And he is clapping even louder than the students. If Diane's sister were here right now, she would simply say, Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Stop it. I'm serious. I read a few chapters of the book, but that last bit you read in front of everyone. It was remarkable. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Excuse me, would you both like another drink? I'm still on my second. And I'm still on my third, so we'll both take one more. Right away, sir. And this is why I wore the dress uniform. Great service at restaurants. As if you ever had trouble without it. Hell, I could be wearing an astronaut's space suit and they'd still sit my ass near the bathroom. I see your point, but... Doesn't it get exhausting, making everything about the color of your skin? But that's my point. The color of my skin isn't an issue for me. It's an issue for everyone else. That's your problem, not ours. Okay, I deserve that. But I think you're underestimating how universal your book is. I know you just see some old white guy in uniform and the public just throwing rose petals at his feet when he walks, but it's really not like that. Sorry, excuse me again. The manager would like you to know that these drinks are on the house. You were saying? There are... <clears throat> There are things going on in my life that no one would understand. Except for you, maybe. And I'm tired of maintaining this cover. A cover? As what? A spy? No. As someone who's happy right now. Logan, are you okay? Maybe I did have one drink too many. Can we talk? Like, really talk? Away from here? What do you have in mind? Walking into Logan's hotel this time feels different from the Hay Adams a few days earlier. When she walked in that time, it felt like she was there for work. This time, it feels like she's there to have an affair. Suddenly the romance of the moment slips away. She feels cheap, not sure she wants to be there. Sorry for making a fool out of myself earlier. Alcohol and melancholy do not mix. Logan, don't confuse melancholy for honesty. Your truth may be sad today, but it can be inspirational tomorrow. That's usually the case for men like you. The first time I met the president was during the primaries in South Carolina. He was charming, but I couldn't imagine ever taking an order from him as my commander-in-chief. Of course, when it was clear that he was going to be the nominee, I sidled up to him like a sorority girl. I did that man's bidding for three years up until yesterday morning, when he fired me. Diane tries not to react, but the general just dropped a headline bigger than WikiLeaks. No wonder he's so vulnerable. I don't understand. Why did he fire you? He said something about having other plans for me. That usually means some kind of metal on my shoulder, and then taking me out back and shooting me in the face. I want to say the right thing, but for now all I can think of is, I'm sorry. I really am, Logan. If you don't want to write the biography anymore, I'll understand. But this is a part of your story. A story that's far from over. I didn't mean to make this all about me. I'm ruining your moment. I've done book readings before. You know, my husband hasn't come to one in months. I gotta say... Seeing a friendly face out there in the crowd was really... nice. She can see that he's really listening to her. So different from her husband whose eyes just drift off when she starts talking about her book. Or her life. She can't even remember the last time he asked her a real question. But not Logan. He's right there with her, staring her in the eyes. Can I ask you something, Diane? Shoot. Are you happy? It takes her aback. 
but she recovers quickly and dodges the question. You know, you're not exactly who I thought you'd be. And before you ask, that's a good thing. I feel the same way. The truth is, I wanted a writer that I could control. But instead, I got this undercover genius. You're the best-kept secret in D.C. Hopefully after this book, we can change all that. Don't go throwing that genius word around too often. This is the first time I've ever said anything like that. It isn't the drinks, though she really has to stop. Three's enough. It's something even more intoxicating. It's passion. Logan Evans makes Diane feel passionate about her writing again. About herself. If the first time was physical chemistry, this time it feels like their souls are connecting. She reaches out and touches his flushed cheeks. And then she leans in, puts her lips on his. At first she kisses him sweetly. His lips are so soft, like sinking into another dimension that keeps pulling her in. Then she kisses him, urgently. She can feel the heat matched moment for moment, and then makes a decision. For the first time in a long time, maybe ever, she surrenders. She lets go of everything she's supposed to be and just is. When they break apart minutes later, there's only one thought going through her head. She wants more, and more is what she gets. Diane normally wakes up to the sound of screaming kids. Not today. Today she wakes up to the intoxicating aroma of hot bacon. She opens her eyes and sees breakfast on the small round table next to the window overlooking Piedmont Park. Pouring the coffee is Logan Evans, wearing nothing but a smile. Normally, Diane would dub this the breakfast of shame. But honestly, she doesn't feel any shame at all. In fact, she feels invigorated. Good morning. Where are your clothes? Uh, over there in the, uh... Oh my god. Did you hang your clothes neatly in the closet? Stop it. I'm still vulnerable. So how'd you sleep? Like a Lincoln log. What time is it? 9.15. Really? <laughs> I haven't slept that long in years. That's sad. I know, right? No, it's sad that you think waking up at 9.15 a.m. is sleeping in. What time are you heading back to D.C.? About an hour ago. <laughs> Should I feel guilty about making you late? Logan, I don't think you've ever felt guilty a day in your life. Ah, that's probably true. Guilt is a useless emotion, and I'm projecting. I'm late, and I have to get going. When can I see you again? You know, for work. And more? Soon, I hope? Yes, ma'am. Just remember to only use the burner phone to call me from now on, okay? Okay. I'm going to go to the bathroom real quick and get dressed. Soon, I hope? Diane can't believe she said that. Even crazier, she can't believe she actually means it. Logan opens the door to his townhouse and is immediately hit with the smell of grilled pork chops with bacon-wrapped scallops, his favorite, usually reserved for special occasions. Honey! Logan wasn't lying to Diane when he told her that he and his wife have been distant for years. But man, there's no denying that she keeps a beautiful home. Everything in its place and not a spot of dust on the hardwood floors. She should have gone to West Point instead of Vassar. I'm in the kitchen! The first thing Logan sees when he opens the door are dirty pots and pans soaking in the sink. On the dining room table are two plates filled with food. Deborah's at the counter wearing a soiled apron and a big smile. She's the perfect picture of a 1950s housewife. You made me my favorite. What's the occasion? I just felt like doing something special. So, how was the conference? A military conference for veterans in Atlanta. That's the lie Logan told his wife. Boring. Lots of people patting each other on the back and sharing old war stories. Oh, and Colonel Miller was there. Do you remember him? He had way too much to drink. We had to carry him out of a local bar when he started singing, You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Deborah's smile has been replaced by a look he can't quite place. Sounds exciting. Her voice sounds odd, too. Nah, just a bunch of old guys being old drunks. You know how it is. Actually, I have no idea how it is. You know what else I don't know? I don't know why my husband told me he was going to Atlanta for a military conference when my friend Stacy over at the DOD called me to express how upset she was that you were fired. Aw, oh, shit. Logan considers lying to cover his tracks. He could tell her that he quit and had something else lined up. Or maybe just use the word classified a bunch of times and tell her that he can't talk about it. But as Logan stands there looking at his wife, he decides to try a whole new tactic. The truth. You're right. I'm sorry. I should have told you, but I was embarrassed. For as long as we've been together, I've always succeeded. Got to the next level, you know? I just couldn't look at you in the face and tell you that I've been fired. What Logan hears next... He could have never anticipated. 
<laughs> laughing. Logan, you are so full of shit. Okay, you got fired, and you were embarrassed. These are normal human reactions. But do you think I'm forgetting that you just came back from Atlanta from some made-up military conference? How stupid do you think I am? Logan, is there even a Colonel Miller? Honey, I... Deborah picks up Logan's plate of food. Do you know why I made your favorite? Pork chops and bacon-wrapped scallops? I made it because I wanted to show you what it's like to love something. And then watch as someone throws it all away. Logan watches his wife storm out of the kitchen. He doesn't know how to spin this, but he can have his entire life fall apart in a matter of days. This is the best Pentecostal church in the city. It's something that Diane and her sister Loretta do every Sunday without fail. The church is filled with black faces and big glorious hats. It's an early morning party for Jesus, and there's always wine on tap. Diane pokes her sister in the side and leans over, keeping her eyes on the pastor. I have something to tell you! What? Later, at the coffee place! This is a good sermon today! No, it's important! And I have to tell you here! It's the only place you won't react! Now she has her attention. She can already see that look of annoyance creeping across her face. She's gonna have to spit it out fast. I slept with Logan Evans! What? I had sex with the general! Did you just say you had sex with the general? Are you out of your mind? He's not what you think he is. Well, I know he's not your husband. Diane, why would you do that? What the hell are you thinking? I'm thinking that I'm doing something for me for once. Don't you pull that crap with me. Are you trying to destroy your entire life? Why should I feel guilty? Tim has been taking me for granted for years. To be straight up, I don't even know if he would care if I left him. Please tell me you're not thinking of leaving Tim for a guy you barely even know. Someone who represents everything we've been fighting against, who also happens to be married? Jesus, Diane. I'm not leaving Tim. I was just making a point. He came to see me read, Loretta. Tim never did that. Logan sat there in that audience and truly listened to me. He understood me. And what about your kids? If this whole thing blows up, what will happen to your kids? Shh, Loretta, this could be the start of something good. Look, I'll be careful. Nothing is going to blow up, I promise. Diane sits in Beltway rush hour traffic, thinking about the documents Logan gave her. What kind of secrets could he possibly be alluding to? War crimes? Election fraud? Maybe it's just another cliché sex scandal. Either way, if Logan wants to make the biography even bigger, it's even better for Diane. Hello? Hey, girl! I just sent you an email regarding potential interview subjects for the book, but we have to cross off a couple names. Okay, who? Sergeant Owens and Charlotte Shine. I, like, just found out Sergeant Owens is dead. So tragic. Choked to death on a chicken nugget. Okay, uh, and Charlotte Shine? I don't know. Uncle Logan just told me not to contact her. Under any circumstances. Really? That's kind of weird, no? Okay, I'm late for something else. Bye! Why would Logan tell Nellie they weren't allowed to contact Charlotte Shine? Isn't she the principal deputy director of national intelligence? Logan must have worked with her at some point. Maybe she knows something about Collins? Diane wouldn't be much of a journalist if she didn't follow the clues. Next one ready to order? After a couple of phone calls and sweet-talking a receptionist, Diane is able to track down her target at a vegan deli. Diane sees a blonde woman wearing a black skirt and a crisp white blouse that looks so sleek a stain wouldn't dare stick to it. The blonde woman is sitting in the corner by herself. Diane walks over and taps her on the shoulder. Charlotte? The woman turns around. Bingo. She looks just like the picture Diane saw on the internet. Can I help you? I'm Diane Hennings. I'm supposed to interview you for the biography I'm writing on General Evans. Diane sees a look of surprise on Charlotte's face. Order number 52. Excuse me, that's my order. This isn't a good time. I'll be quick, just some simple background stuff. Lunch is the only time I get to be alone and decompress. Oh, I totally get that. My two boys don't even let me pee by myself. This is intentional. Using her boys? In her intel search, she learned Charlotte has a son too. It works. Charlotte pauses and her face softens. I can give you two minutes, but that's it. Understood. Diane sits across from her and tries to speak casually. So, how long have you known General Evans? I first met him when I worked at Homeland Security. That was at least 20 years ago. So you weren't the principal deputy director of national intelligence then? Oh, God, no. Back then, I was just an aide. And you worked in the same department as the general? Yes. He was my boss. Was it anything like the devil wears fatigues? No, he was very professional. Diane anticipated this might be difficult. Secrets in D.C. are like currency, and they don't spend it on just anyone. If Diane wants to get anything, she's going to have to work harder. Hey, 
I'm not doing a story for the New York Times. This is for Logan's biography. I'm not going to include anything salacious. Whatever you tell me is between the two of us. I just wanted its background. Logan? General Evans. So, how would you describe your relationship with him? Cordial and professional. Still, you were his aide. Did he ever share any secrets with you? Can I give you some advice, Miss Diane? Okay. Be careful. Be careful of what? Everything. If you have a job to do, then do it. But do your job in a manner that doesn't make you feel so comfortable that you call the director of the CIA, who's also a four-star general, Logan. No, Diane is 100% certain there's something more here. Charlotte, is there anything more you can tell me about Black Bolt? For the record, my name is Miss Sean, and your two minutes are up. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Follow True Love on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. The next episode will be out in a week, or you can listen to it ad-free right now by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at Wondery.com survey. This is episode two of our four-part series, The General and the Journalist. I'm Justin Walker-White. And I'm Amber Rashawn Williams. Kevin Arbery wrote the story. Our associate producer is Brian White. Sound design is by Jamie Cooper. Additional audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez and Adrian Tapia. Casting by Kate Geller. Our senior producers are Kevin Arbway and Sochi Dorsey. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jentz and Marshall Louis for Wondery. Wondery.